theoretical physicist Michio Kaku once said, the human brain has 100 billion neurons, each neuron connected to 10,000 other neurons. Sitting on your shoulders is the most complicated object in the known universe. Our brain is undeniably an incredibly complex and impressive object, and this is best demonstrated with brain plasticity, a term that refers to the brain's ability to change and adapt as a result of experience, and it will be the topic of today's show. Hi, I'm Sam Breakgear, and welcome to Brains Bite Back. Your podcast looking at everything to do with psychology, technology, and our society. To better understand brain plasticity and the process that takes place when we learn new skills, we spoke with Alicia Wolf, a neuroscientist and a senior lecturer in the Department of Cognitive Science at Rensselaer. Wolf studies the brain mechanisms of stress and reproductive hormones as they relate to behavior and cognition, brain plasticity, and brain health over the lifespan. Her specific areas of expertise are memory, emotions, and social interactions, and how these functions not only arise from the brain, but change the brain itself. In this episode, Wolf explains how the job of London cab drivers impacts the hippocampus, the area of the brain responsible for memory, how capable we are to retrain in tech jobs relating to cyber encoding at a later age, and what studies on frequent video game players versus novices shows us about brain plasticity. She also discusses how the olfactory sense can help us better understand dementia and memory. If you like this topic, then some previous episodes of Brains Bite Back that you might enjoy are Sexual Neuroscientists on Technology and the Sexual Recession of Younger Generations, Neurofeedback, a software upgrade for the brain, and Ex-CERN Scientist on Leveraging AI to Accelerate Language Learning. And don't forget to follow, like, and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. Tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, who you are, and your background in psychology, please. Yeah, so hi, my name is Alicia Wolf. I am a neuroscientist. Specifically, I studied behavioral neuroscience. That's what I got my PhD in. And that's a subfield of neuroscience where we use behavior as a way to understand how the brain works. But also, and this is really what gets me excited, is how behavior itself alters the brain. Uh, Specifically in behavioral neuroscience, I studied how hormones are mechanisms in the brain related to behaviors. Okay. Yeah, I'm really interested by brain plasticity. That's why when I saw your profile, I was very interested in having you on here. Because we've had topics which are similar to this and kind of revolve around it, but we've never really got stuck into it. And I find it particularly interesting because I think it just demonstrates how incredible the brain is. And before we go ahead with it, I would love to know if you're able to explain what brain plasticity is, brain plasticity is, and give some examples of how it works for our listeners who might not know exactly what it is. Yeah, that's a really good question. Brain plasticity is somewhat a term that is shorthand for many different mechanisms in the brain that involve its change. So that's how the brain is really interesting. It's already a really complex organ, but it doesn't just stay stagnant. It's always changing. So it can be somewhat elusive in that way, which is also exciting. So one way people often think about brain plasticity and get really excited about it is considering how the adult brain can grow new neurons. This was just recognized even like in the 1990s. So it's not that long ago in the field of neuroscience. So that's exciting. But also I think what's exciting about and related to what brain plasticity is, is those changes that occur in the neurons that have been there. They might've been there for most of your life, but they don't stay stagnant either. So they might get incorporated with other circuits, say with the new neurons that are born throughout our life. They might have changes in their anatomy. So they might have differences in what we call the dendrites or even the axons. So these appendages on the neurons that are involved in connecting to others. And then even at those connections, there can be changes. We call that synaptic plasticity. So changes right there um, in terms of how those neurons communicate and changes in things like the chemicals that the neurons produce and respond to. And that's what got me really interested in plasticity because chemicals like hormones, 
which we think of being produced in our body, but also they can be produced in our brain, that seems to be one of these kinds of chemical mechanisms for how brain plasticity can occur and can be supported. Okay, would you be able to bring up some examples and case studies of the most incredible like um, findings or research or, or case studies exactly that, that exists when looking at brain plasticity and that you've come across? Wow, there's so many good examples of brain plasticity and they just keep coming out. Um, but I'll start with, let me think. Uh, so one example that was coming out right around the time when people were agreeing in the neuroscience community that yes, it looks like adults can have new neurons being formed. We have really overwhelming evidence of this. It was debated for a long time. And those are studies that actually are ones that were done in London taxi cab drivers. Hmm. So you, you might be familiar. Uh, so with this, these studies, and it's a whole, I mean, this research lab has been studying this for decades now, but one of the first studies showed that individuals that had been taxi cab drivers for a long time, so really working their brains, um, dealing with navigating a very complex city, with a lot of time pressure. Um, and it's something that people are, are really trained at. They're experts in that, in the field. Those individuals that had been doing that kind of work longer um, for, you know, let's say decades, had a larger area of a brain region called the hippocampus, which we know, especially in studies in rats, we know this is involved in running mazes and other kinds of aspects of memory. But it was clear that the volume in that region was larger than what you saw in individuals that were a similar age, maybe even drove buses. They followed up with studies where it's not the, just the driving alone, but just really pushing yourself, having a challenging job like that. You see these differences in that brain region. So that was a really interesting study, especially because it was in humans. A lot of the work before that had even been in animal models, but then when we could see it in humans, related to a behavior that people do for a living. It was really, really, really exciting. That's, I think, one really good example. Some more recent examples that my students always get really interested in are some studies where they've looked at people that are experts in video games versus those that are not. Um, and so, you know, they look at differences. Again, these are younger individuals, generally in these studies at least, who have been playing video games regularly for years versus those that are novices or those that are, you know, don't play that often. And again, they see there, not that there's necessarily huge differences in the size of brain regions, but differences in what regions um, seem to be more active when people that are experts are playing the video games um, versus the novices. So suggesting major changes in circuitry. Um, so that's just another way to look at plasticity, another kind of interesting example in humans. Um, I could go on and on, but those are some that I, you know, thought of right away. Yeah, I, th I think those are great examples. I can't remember why this is the case or how true this is, or even if I did hear it during my degree, but uh, it's interesting that for cab drivers, the hippocampus is impacted by their career because I've also heard that flight attendants due to the fact that they have to change time zones and fly so much, it negatively impacts their hippocampus. And I remember that specifically because my dad is a flight attendant. So I've always like thought to myself, like, how is this going to impact him? But I can't remember the science or research behind that. You might know more about that than I do. And yeah, I definitely find that the video games interesting. I don't play video games anymore, but when I was 17, I absolutely loved them. And now whenever I pick up a controller to play an old video game, somehow it comes right back to me. So I don't know if my brain has like solidified that part of like playing this game. But um, yeah, I'm a bit rusty at first, but it comes back to me. So yeah, I can really relate to that. And I, I know that you mentioned one of the breakthroughs is that adults do have the ability to produce new neurons. That kind of relates to the main topic of this show, which I wanted to discuss. Because research has shown that older adults are less likely to use or be willing to use technology than younger people. And can our understanding of brain plasticity help to explain why this is? Yeah, so that's an interesting question because, you know, I think maybe this is from my perspective, I study stress, so, and how stress can alter brain plasticity. And so I, when I think of it, I think, well, it could be that 
in some individuals who are not used to using technology, it's changed so much, even in people that, you know, have used some technology throughout their lives, it changes very rapidly, that there could be a bit of stress, so producing some reluctance in using the technology. It doesn't necessarily feel good for us to be doing things that we don't feel that we're, do we're good at, right? This produces, um, I mean, we've all had that experience throughout our lives, but I think that's, you know, that's my opinion of um, why that might happen. And it's particularly thinking the stress aspect when we are de dealing with, with the unknown or dealing with things that maybe we've, you know, we don't know how to solve that problem that can also make us avoid it in a way. So, you know, and then if that happens and bringing it back to the brain plasticity question, then when it's, people always say, oh, the brain's like a muscle. When you don't use it, you know, that, that, that aspect of it might not be engaged enough. So then it could become harder even if people, you know, don't engage it. Like many of us, we do certain things and then maybe at that point, we're really good at it. You give it up for a few years or decades, or you just don't put as many efforts into it. We come back, we usually can do it at some level, uh, but maybe not at that level you remember being good at. So that could be part of it too. I suppose that goes back to that video game kind of explanation where I said about, I haven't played them for years, but I pick it up a bit rusty and then it comes back to me. <laughs> Definitely. Does the brain have any kind of like inability to like, I suppose, is there any evidence or do you see a brain having an inability to physically adapt to technology in the sense like the brain just doesn't have the capacity or is it irrelevant? You could be 25 or 75 and you still have the same capacity if you have the willingness to adopt new technology? Well, I think it depends. I think um, in typical situations, yeah, a lot of it is about that willingness, that taking on those challenges, which is really important for brain plasticity. But then in some cases, there's going to be individuals, say, if we're talking about dementia or some situation where you have severe losses in brain function, you know, um, even neurons, many different neurodegenerative disorders, there we might get to the point of like, okay, then we might have difficulty overcoming such losses. Um, the brain can be plastic when individuals do have different diseases that alter the brain, but at some point it seems, you know, really far into the disease, um, there would be that difficulty trying to overcome it. But I think at some level, you know, again, under like normal circumstances, kind of typical, you know, maybe an older brain, but still a generally healthy brain for that person's age. Yeah, um, there's still that capacity, even though people might be reluctant because it puts us out of our comfort zone, as we call it. But often that's where you see the brain plasticity when you do um, kind of the thing that's harder. Yeah, I, for the first time in my life, experienced kind of a in, on my behalf, a rejection of technology, just because I thought, oh, you know what, I'm too old for this. And quite honestly, I'm 27 years old, but TikTok, this social media platform, I, I, I heard that like that's exploded in the past year. And I'm just like, oh, I can't be bothered to learn another social media app. So I think it's very much in the case of not so much that I don't have the mental capacity to, I'm sure it's very easy to use. And maybe if I tried it, I might like it, but it's more the case of like, oh, I, I can't be bothered with this. I don't have that desire. But um, yeah, that's right. the first time I can relate to rejecting technology thinking, oh, I can't be bothered. I'm, it's, it's a young, it's for teenagers. Right. No, no, I believe I understand that. I have a young son and yeah, he knows all about TikTok and all these things. Um, sometimes I think, oh, well, being a professor, also having a younger son, that helps keep my brain more plastic because at least I know they exist. Yeah. Do I choose to use all of this? Not necessarily. Not that I can't, but I just, yeah, it's that willingness. Um, you know, how much time can I spend on other things? But when you're motivated, your brain really has such unlimited capacity. So they used to think, I mean, you know, even in my early days of studying neuroscience and psychology, they used to say, okay, you know, aging is really like your brain, you know, you're just losing neurons, just like your body is having difficulty, the brain just kind of goes downhill. Um, and then, you know, you should learn everything that's really difficult, even before you hit puberty. This is how a lot of schooling was set up. You know, you didn't learn new languages after, you know, 12, 13, 14. But then it turns out that's, that's not true. 
people, even older adults, um, even though maybe there's some difficulties, maybe the learning curve is a little different than say an eight year old, a nine year old, uh, yet you might have more time, but if you're really willing to, you can. You can learn these completely new things um, well into your, you know, your many years into your life. That's reassuring because I know there's a transition at the moment where a lot of people are losing their jobs either because of COVID or related to automation or for one reason or another. And one of the answers to this is supposedly getting into cyber or coding and learning all these new skills. And even though I can understand some people might be reluctant to, because like you said, it's stressful. It's a new thing. It's no one really likes to engage in things that they're not particularly good at or well-trained at, Mm -hmm. but it's reassuring to know that they have the capacity or the potential to like, there's nothing physiologically in their brain stopping them from from being able to make this transition if they have the intention right exactly just pushing yourself to learn those new things can it can happen you know and yeah a lot of people are uh having to learn new skills perhaps because of jobs and changes um just based upon covid and everything else that's happening but also i also you know to try to look at the good side sometimes it's hard but i try to in some cases, people have been home spending time, maybe learning new things that they hadn't done before. Um, I've tried many recipes, you know, in these past, you know, nine months, I mean, just as one example. And, um, you know, so sometimes part of the problem, I think, is people maybe want to learn new things, but they don't always have the time, right? We're always so limited in our time. Um, we have jobs, we have all of our other responsibilities, or we spend time doing other things that maybe we could be using that time to focus on learning new skills. And so that's one kind of interesting thing that I think is happening now. Yeah, definitely. I can relate to that as well, because during the quarantine, I I was like, you know what, I need to spend this time productively. I need to come out of this Mm -hmm. quarantine with a skill or at least some skills or something to show for it. So I started learning French and I've been listening to podcasts and I've been doing Duolingo every day. I'm now on like 160 days and uh, I can see the progress. I mean, it's not much. I can't have a conversation yet, but I can like read and understand more than I certainly could before the quarantine. And I know that learning a language supposedly is one of the best ways to protect yourself against dementia. And you mentioned dementia earlier. I don't know if that's right. You can correct me on that if I'm wrong. But on that kind of note, I'd love to know as someone that studies how our brains work, what are some tips that you can share with us to keep our brains in good shape? Yeah, with this understanding that we do have brain plasticity, it opens up so many doors. It opens up, uh, you know, it kind of closes the door of like, okay, things just keep getting worse as you get older. So that's good. And also it opens up the doors of like, yeah, maybe focusing on this brain plasticity can also reduce likelihood of developing things like dementia. And so some of the work that my lab is doing now is looking at how certain behaviors, like some trainings, can reduce risk for Alzheimer's disease as one of the major types of dementia, you know, worldwide. And one thing that we have come across, and, you know, there's others that have been doing this kind of work worldwide, is even focusing on specific areas of the brain. So having specific trainings, as we know more and more about the brain, we have greater understanding that certain functions might be housed in certain regions of the brain. In say Alzheimer's disease, one of the areas of the brain that declines earliest is a part we barely think about, but this is our olfactory brain. So involved in sense of smell, which as humans, we kind of, we do it, but not not like other animals that we know, right? Um, We're a little bit biased towards vision. But this is an area that we've started to look at, well, can you just enhance people's sense of smell? How do you do that? Well, expose them to different scents, and then they learn these. So it's like this scent training. And I mean, we do this, often we think about visual training, like recognizing different objects throughout our lives. That's something, you know, different languages, it's somewhat related to that, Uh, learning these different things. So yeah, I think challenging the brain um, in different ways is a way to maintain brain health, and perhaps reduce some of those risks. I mean, we're really early in the research, but it's exciting. Other tips in terms of brain health, well, 
one, the brain is part of the body, so you got to keep the body healthy. I mean, these we as neuroscientists think the brain's over here and this separate thing outside of the body, but of course they're not. So, you know, all the things that we know that are good for our bodies, sleeping, good diet, exercise, just to name the ones we all know this, it's certainly good for our brains, of course. You know, that's one aspect. But other specific tips are just literally ch trying to challenge your brain. Like you said, learning new languages, learning new things, learning new technologies. Um, as a stress researcher, another major tip would be as best you can to reduce the amount of stress you experience. Stress is ubiquitous, yes, uh, but we can alter our responses to it. You know, are we going to take an approach that can lead to brain health or do we take this other approach that maybe enhances the amount of stress? So one way we can kind of focus on reducing stress and it works really well is engaging in different behaviors, specifically, you know, social connection, even if it's, you know, through remotely like we do nowadays, it's still a social connection and those are kinds of things that are really good for brain health and for reducing stress. And, you know, we can do this without having a lot of resources um, or necessary, you know, and kind of using our time wisely to maintain our brain health. So those are some of the, you know, some tips. Uh, those are just more reasons to eat well and exercise and get that, get sleep. I think sleep is one of the most underappreciated ones, especially in our society, because there's this like um, glorification of the less sleep you get, the better in the sense that people brag about getting up at like 4.30 or 3.30 a.m. And it's like, well, if you're going to get eight hours of sleep and you're going to get up at 4.30 then like, what time are you going to, what is that like, um, I don't know, like 8.30 or something? Like you've got mm -hmm. to go to bed pretty early. So I do all I can to try and get that. And then obviously exercise and eat healthy. Those, those are things we all know. Mm -hmm. And it was funny that you mentioned about the olfactory senses because you're right in the sense that smell is so deeply attached to our memory. It's like, mm -hmm. there are so often when you smell some food and you maybe it brings you back to your childhood or a fragrance and it brings you back to a person. It's incredible how deeply entrenched our sense of smell is with our memories. I didn't know that, but it doesn't come too much as a surprise that they're so, so tightly linked, especially when it comes to like dementia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like memories and emotional memories. Mm, yeah. um, and I think these are things, at least speaking from the neuroscience perspective, in some ways we haven't delved too deeply into. I mean, the brain is complex. So there's some parts of it we're just kind of starting those those types of studies but it's interesting um you know just even refocusing and like noticing your scent environment you know what you smell and you know how that might be related to memories and building emotions and things like that i think it would be it's it's an interesting way to go about thinking about brain plasticity again right through our senses i mean this is how the brain experiences the world through all of our senses and that's just you know one I think really interesting example. And definitely. And if people want to keep up with the work you're doing, I, I know you said you're still you're working on projects and there's still research which is inconclusive or not inconclusive at the moment, but you, that you're working on. Uh, and if people do want to keep up with that or just generally keep up with yourself, is there any kind of social media or website you can point them to or any way they can get in contact with you? Um, yeah, I mean, you can get in contact with me through uh, RPI's website, I guess. I don't really do, do, I do social media, but it's more for, I do Facebook just for family. Here's my pictures of my puppy <laughs> kind of stuff. I don't do That's too okay. much with work. No worries. But yeah, oh, yeah. We can put a, a link to that in, um, in the description of this, this podcast and they can keep yeah. up to date with anything you're working on. Yeah, I know. I really should build a website. <laughs> that would be a new skill that I'd have to learn. Um, I know it's pretty easy. You can get these templates now, but it's also like, uh, you know, where do you spend your time? On? And I'm all like, no, I shall I'll go cook a recipe <laughs> instead of doing a website. You know, I prefer cooking like too. That. Don't worry. I'm fully on that <laughs> side. I'm, I'm team yeah. cooking over building a website. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. But I know it's not good for all this, um, you know, connecting kind of thing, but emails, um, I mean, people can find my email easily through a search like that too. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today and uh, yeah, yeah. best of luck with your research. All right. Thank you. 
This episode is brought to you by Publicize, a digital PR company that grows businesses' online presence. And for a limited time only, exclusive to Brains Bite Back listeners, you can receive an SEO assessment as part of your package for any tier of service at no extra charge with this special promotion. To find out more, visit publicize.co slash BBB. We are finished for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And as ever, you can subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your podcast from. You can follow us on YouTube and go to social.co to check out all of our episodes and articles on topics just like this. We hope you join us again soon. And until next time, take care of yourself. <laughs>